Hey guys, in this video we're going to be talking about chapter 7 of the Ecce Romani textbook titled News from Rome. And in this story you're going to be reading about a messenger who arrives from Rome with a letter for Gaius. The grammar for this chapter is extremely important as you're finally going to learn about declensions, which is a really foundational idea of how Latin works. We've been talking about it for the past couple chapters, we just haven't been using the word declension and you haven't seen the full picture yet. In this chapter, you'll finally see it and understand more about Latin grammar. As always, we want to start with the vocabulary. And again, the key to it is learning the derivatives. So let's start with the word occupatus, which in Latin means busy. From this, in English, we get the derivatives of occupied and occupation. And again, it's holding the same spelling and the same meaning. If you're occupied, you're busy. Just like your occupation is your job, something that will keep you busy. From spectant, we get the words spectator, spectacle, inspect, and speculate in English. And spectant is a verb that means they look at or they watch, and it's holding that same meaning in English. A spectator is someone who's watching something, just like a spectacle is something that you watch. Nuntius in Latin is a word that means messenger. And it's coming from the verb nuntiare, which means to announce or report. And it gives us a bunch of English derivatives, such as denounce, announcer, enunciate, and pronounce. And you can tell that they're all holding this root of a messenger or a reporter. So for instance, an announcer in a sporting event is the person who's reporting details of the game to an audience. And if you think of enunciate and pronounce, it's talking about how you speak which is what a messenger does. They're delivering a message. In From wane it, we get the English derivatives of adventure, convene, intervene, and prevent. And the word wane it means here she comes in Latin. And if you think of the word adventure, it's going off on a journey. You're going somewhere. And if you think of convene, you're coming together. All four of these words in English are holding on to that exact same meaning as the Latin. Salutat in Latin means he or she greets, and in English this leads to the, to the derivatives of salute, salutations, and salutatorium, and all three are holding on to this meaning of greeting someone. So a salute in English is a greeting, just like salutations is another way of saying hello, and a salutatorian, for instance at a high school graduation, is the person who will give their speech first. So in other words, they're welcoming the crowd or greeting the crowd. You've actually seen this verb salutat before in its form of salve, which means hello in Latin. It's holding on to the exact same meaning, and it comes from the same root. From duke it, we get a few English derivatives, including abduct, deduce, induce, and seduce. And if you think about their meanings in English, you can see how they're all related to this root of he or she leads. So if someone is abducted, it literally means they've been led away. And if someone is seduced, you're trying to lead them towards you. In English, a few derivatives that might help you are the words duke and duchess, which are two words for leaders. So a duke and a duchess are the male and female leaders of a country. Trod it means he or she hands over. And in English, this leads to the words tradition, traitor, and treason. They all have to do with handing over something. So a tradition is literally something that's passed down from generation to generation. And a traitor is someone who's gone against their country, probably by handing over some sort of secret. So you can see all three of these words have that same Latin root of handing over. Princeps is a word that means emperor in Latin. And from this we get prince, principal, and principality. So if you think of a prince, he is the leader of a country. You know, the son of a king, he's an important person. Just like a principal is the leader of a high school. They're both coming from this root of princeps, which was the emperor. From ad urbem, specifically the word urbem, which means city, we get urban, urbane, suburb, and suburban. And again, all four of these words have to do with a city. And they're coming from that root urbem, or urbs is the nominative form, that means city in Latin. From revocat, which means he or she calls back or recalls, we get the word revoke in English, and it means the exact same thing. And if you look, this is coming from the root vocare, which means to call, 
And you can think of a vocation in English. It's your calling. All these words are coming from that exact same root. From consulare, which means to consult, we get the words counselor, counsel, consult, and consultant. And again, all four are holding on to this root of consulting someone. Now, the grammar for this chapter is going back to nouns and adjectives. And we're going to be looking at the endings as, os, and es. And as you learn, these have to do with direct objects, and these three endings are their plural forms. So let's just recap. So far, we've only seen singular direct objects, and these have ended in am, um, and em. So for instance, if you think of the phrase, the wolf frightens the girl, we would write that lupus puellam teret. And you can see that the word the girl, which is the direct object in this sentence, ends in am with the word puellam. It means there's one girl, and it's the direct object of the sentence. But what if you wanted to make the direct object plural? So when you have a plural direct object, we use a different set of endings. Specifically, we're going to use as, os, and es. So let's go back to our original sentence, the wolf frightens the girl, lupus puellam teret. So if we wanted to make that plural and say the wolf frightens the girls, we wouldn't say puellam anymore. We would switch it to lupus puellas teret. Now we've changed the number from singular to plural, and it doesn't mean the wolf frightens the girl, it now means the wolf frightens the girls. So let's just review this idea quickly. So again, when you have a direct object that ends in am, to make it plural we're going to switch it to as. Likewise, um will become os, and em will become es. These endings are what you want to use whenever you have a plural so the next idea in the grammar for this chapter is something called cases and declensions. Now these are two really important ideas, so you want to focus in on this part of the chapter, as this is the foundation for all of Latin. So first we want to ask, what is a case? And in Latin, nouns have different endings depending on how they're being used in the sentence. So for instance, if we take the, the phrase, the boy chases the wolf. The word the boy is being used in a particular way. If we switch it to the wolf chases the boy, we've changed the meaning of the sentence. In the first sentence, the boy is the subject. He's the one doing the chasing. In the second sentence, the boy is now the direct object. He's the thing being chased. We've changed the meaning of the sentence. In Latin, we would have to change the ending, even though in English, it stays exactly the same. These different endings and uses of a noun are what we call cases. So, the form of a noun that's used as the subject or the complement of a sentence is what we call the nominative case in Latin. So, for instance, servus lupem teret, the slave frightens the wolf. If we break this down, we can find the subject pretty easily. In this case, the subject is servus, the slave. This is the subject, we call it the nominative case. The form of a noun used as the direct object of a sentence is what we call the accusative case. So let's go back to our sentence. Servus lupem teret, the slave frightens the wolf. Now that we know that servus is the subject, we can pretty easily find the direct object. This direct object is lupum, the wolf, and we can see that the spelling is slightly different and it has a different ending of U-M. This is what we call the accusative case. So just a quick recap. The nominative case is what we call the subject or the complement of the sentence. And when you have a noun that's being used as the direct object, we call this the accusative case. So now we want to ask ourselves, what is a declension? And in Latin, we group nouns into specific categories. These are what we're calling declensions. It's the grouping of nouns. And the nouns in each specific declension have the exact same endings. That's how we're grouping them together. So just a helpful hint. The noun endings within a declension are always the same. They don't ever change. And since they don't change, this makes them predictable. 
This means that if you know what declension a noun belongs to, you can always determine what ending it's going to have, and you can predict what its endings will be when it's used in a different way in the sentence. So what are these declensions? Well, we have the first three here, and we'll learn two more later on in the book, but for now, we have first, second, and third declension, and these are the endings that go with it. So in red, we have the singular and plural nominative, and in blue, we have the singular and plural accusative. And there's a couple important things you want to notice here. So the first thing you want to notice is that in the nominative singular, the third declension is just a dash, meaning there is no set pattern. This is where we often see words that will end in R. But there's not a distinct pattern that you can always rely on. It can be a couple of different things. Next, you want to look through the rest of the third declension endings, and you'll notice that they all have E in them. So you have EM, ES, and ES. If we look over at the first declension, you'll notice that these endings are all having an A in them. So you have A, AM, AE, AS. Likewise, the second declension has U's in it, with US and UM. Now you want to look at the nominative and accusative plural. Nominative plural is the long I, the accusative plural is the long OS. And again, third declension is something slightly different, but you want to pay attention to their endings as well. The last thing you want to take note of is that in the third declension, the nominative and accusative plural are spelled the exact same way. This is something that can cause problems, but we're going to learn how you can tell the difference between the two of these. So the next thing we want to talk about is reading with attention to the cases. And what I mean by this is when you get a Latin sentence such as ser we lupos ex agris repellent, to break it down, you want to really start by looking at the endings of words and figuring out what case they are. By doing this, you'll be able to figure out what its function is in the sentence. So let's start with ser we. We know that that long I ending is the second declension nominative plural. This means that ser we is the subject of our sentence. So we mark it with an S. Next, we can see that ser we as the subject has to be going with the verb repellent. This makes a lot of sense as repellent ends in an NT, which is a plural verb ending. You have a plural subject, you need a plural verb. Next, we want to find out if there's a direct object in this sentence, and there is. We see it with the word lupos. That OS ending we now recognize as being second declension accusative plural. Since we know it's accusative, we know this is the direct object. So, we can mark it with a DO. This direct object is going with repellent. You're saying the slaves drive off what? The answer? The wolves. This makes repellent a transitive verb. Remember, transitive verbs are ones that have a direct object. When we put it all together, now we have all the pieces that we've marked as a core elements, we can translate. We know the subject is the slaves, the slaves are repelling, and they're repelling the wolves. So when you put it all together, you get the slaves repel the wolves out of the fields. The last thing we want to talk about is how you can tell the difference between third declension nominative and accusative plural endings. Now remember, both of those endings are along ES. They're spelled the exact same way. So if we look at our chart, we want to go over to the third declension column and look at the plurals. And again, you're going to see that ES is spelled the exact same way. So the trick to this is that when you're dealing with nominative and accusative plural endings in the third declension, you always have to think about context, meaning what is the sentence telling you? Take an example sentence, magnas voces patres audio. Now if we look at these first three words, we can see that voces and patres have the exact same ending. So these three words are all connected somehow, and we have to distinguish which ones are the accusative and which are the nominative. And the two nouns we're going to be looking at here are woke's and patres. 
So to start, we want to take the adjective magnos, because we know that it's going with one of these nouns. So the options are magnos voces, which would mean the great voices, or magnos patres, which would mean the large or great fathers. We have to figure out which one is going with which. So remember, an adjective agrees with its noun in three ways, case, number, and gender. So let's start by looking at the gender of our two nouns, woces and patres. Since patres means fathers and it's talking about males, we know this is a masculine word, so we can mark it with an M. If you look up the word wokes, or wokes, meaning voice or voices in your dictionary or in the back of your book, you'll see that this is a feminine word. So we have two different genders happening here. So if we look at magnos, we can tell that this is a first declension plural accusative ending. And we can tell by the AS that it's also going to be feminine. If magnos is in a feminine form, it has to be going with wokes. Because remember, it has to match up. Magnos cannot be describing patres. Now that we know that magnos and wokes are going together, we want to figure out the case of these words. Now, looking at magnos, we know this is first declension accusative plural. If it's in the accusative, it's going to be the direct object, so we can mark it with a do. And remember, if magnos is going with wokes, they have to be the same case. This means that wokes is also in the accusative, which makes sense, because remember, the es ending can be third declension plural nominative or accusative. In this case, it's accusative, and we're going to mark it with a do. Next, we want to look at the word patres, and we know that if the magnos and wokes are the direct objects, Patres is not going to be a direct object. It's going to be the subject, which makes sense because the ES can also be third declension nominative plural. So in this case, we mark it with an S. It's the subject of our sentence. Now we can put the entire sentence together using the puzzle pieces we just figured out, and we can translate it. The fathers hear loud voices. Recap. When you encounter third declension nominative or accusative plural nouns in the same sentence, these are the two things you want to consider. Noun adjective agreement and context. When I say noun adjective agreement, I'm talking about the example we just did. So if you think back, by looking at the adjective magnos, we figured out the case, number, and gender of wokes. Likewise, the sentence itself can sometimes tell you the answer. This is what we mean by context. You want to think, what is the sentence telling me? and what makes the most sense. If you do this every time, you'll always figure out the case, number, and gender of a word, specifically a noun, and if it's in the third declension, you can distinguish between that nominative and accusative plural ending.